I'm Felicia Bell, real estate investor and advisor here in the Queen City for over the past seven years. In December 2015, I accepted a package from Procter & Gamble and 30 days later decided that I wanted to pursue a career as a real estate investor. During that time, I had the opportunity to meet a coach, a mentor, a friend who would enable me to transition into this space as well as I have over the past seven years. During that time, I have rehabbed over 15 properties. I am an Airbnb host, a housing provider, realtor, realtist, and a host of other things with regard to real estate. I am so excited to be here today to share with you um, one of my greatest accomplishments, and that is to have become the mother of Swede. Swede is going to be joining me, and we'll be talking to you today about transitions. Hey, Swede. Hey, Mom. Um, it's nice to meet everybody. My name is Swede Mormon the third. I'm 24, going on 25, and a native here in Cincinnati, as well as the son of the real estate mogul herself, Miss Felicia Bell. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I can't wait to talk a little bit about our experiences and um, a little bit about my life growing up, as well as my mom's transition into real estate. Awesome. See, I couldn't have planned it better myself. I'm so proud of Swede. I am so proud of Swede, and I want just to talk a little bit about some of the things that um, we've experienced over this transition We've experienced a lot of transitions over the years. And as I talk about transitioning into real estate, I actually have a whole seminar that I do about transitioning. However, when we talk about transitioning into uh, this space or any transition, one of the most important parts of transitioning is really including your family and making sure that your family is a part of that conversation um, and the process. And I'll have to tell you, more of this has been what I did or didn't do and what I've learned from it, it as, you know, as I talk about transitioning. So some of them are lessons from things I've done and some lessons of things that I didn't do. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, talking to, various people about their transitions, whether it be work or in life, some of the things this will really, I believe, help shed some light on, on the process. So first of all, I want to say, Swede, again, you have made, you and I and you have made a lot of transitions over our lifetime together, right? 24 I can't believe you're going to be 25 in less than a month now it's coming up you're 25 you're excited about being 25 I'm in denial <laughs> that you're 25 okay I just I got to put that out there um but again one of the most important um, parts of a transition is you know family and anybody that knows me knows you because you have continually been an anchor for me, motivation, and definitely you are one of my whys, the number one why. And so I, I want you to talk a little bit about some of the transitions that you've made in your life. I mean, we've moved from place to place a couple of times. We've got Walnut Hills to or Seven Hills to Walnut Hills, Walnut Hills to IU. I mean, we've, we've had quite a few transitions. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the main ones that you um, can remember. Um, so, of course, you know, we've, we've had our fair share of transitions um, over the course of these 24 years. But really, um, I'd like to speak to the past six. Um, and over the course of these six years, I haven't really spent as much time in Ohio. Um, and this is where both professionally and personally, me and my mom have been able to grow um, independent of each other and together. Um, so at the age of 18, like many other high school students, I went off to college. I did four years at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University 
where I studied economic consulting and business analytics. Um, during my time in undergrad, I had the opportunity to live abroad. So I spent four years or four months, apologies, living in Barcelona, which was a transition in and of itself, transitioning from American culture to Spanish culture, from English to Spanish, and even at times from Spanish to Catala. So that was kind of the beginning of this six year period of change in my life. Um, from there, six months later, um, we went through COVID as a, a group and really as a world community, right? Um, so this is, during this time I graduated, I found out that I'd be starting a position with KPMG in their data and analytics tax technology practice. Um, and I also found out that I'd be moving to Denver, Colorado. So over the course of six months, I moved between countries um, I transitioned between being a student to being a full-time employee, and even from a greater perspective, I transitioned from being a boy to a man. Um, you know, I, I joke with my friends that I think there's only one bill I don't pay anymore. So <laughs> um, it, it's, it's we need to work on that. <laughs> yeah, we need to work. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it depends on who you say, right? You said <laughs> you're in denial. I think I'm in denial about that one. But, um, <laughs> so there's been a lot of transition over the years, and. I think that the common theme between them all and what's really kept things together is our trust in each other and um, my trust in, in your vision and your trust in mine. Um, you know, I've moved 2,000 or 1,200 miles away from home, um, and I think that takes a lot of trust for any parent um, to see their child uh, kind of leave their immediate circle. So um, it, it really started with that foundation. and. I think being able to build on that foundation and being able to see the visions that I've set forth since I was a high school student come to life and, and seeing my mom see those come to life has made it easier and, and it's made it easier for her as well to be able to let go and let me spread my wings. So it's a little bit about me. Um, I don't want to ramble, but. No, that's excellent because you mentioned a couple of transitions we that I hadn't even thought about recently but they were major transitions and that was and actually we can go back beyond the six years right because you went to Spain as a was it junior before your junior yeah, before year before my junior year high school yeah in high school you were there for four weeks and I you know now that I'm thinking about it I'm thinking about how nervous I was about you making that transition to Spain and a lot of times I did not want to let you know what was the internal process was for me because I didn't want you to worry about me along the way. But you're right, it's about trust and being able to trust that you had the skills, um, the emotional intelligence, and you know the wherewithal to be able to go that far away from home not just as, a, I mean, especially as a high school student, but when you, you went in college for four months, I mean, I was like, wait a minute. I was kind of used to you traveling, but um, over the past, I mean, that's far. That's and I, far. And I think you said it best. Um, it was something that you were used to, right? And I mean, with any major transition, I don't think it goes from zero to 100. It comes in waves. Mm -hmm. So for me, I mean, as a kid, I was very gung-ho. I was very determined to experience certain things and and push myself to, to do certain things um, that may be the people around me and the people who come before me and my family hadn't necessarily done. So I had tunnel vision. And I think from my perspective, it was about getting to the next step as quickly and efficiently as I can and not really thinking about too many other things, whereas you saw the macro and kind of allowed me to live in my truth and pursue my dreams. And to this day, you even do. But as a kid, it was so important. Um, but on the flip side for you, you started um, from a young age. I think the first time I, I spent time abroad away from you was I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so between the ages of 14 to 20 years old, 20, 21 years old, um, you'd been kind of used to me taking those steps further and further away from the nest so that when the major transition came, when I finally moved to Colorado, um, it was just kind of another notch along the belt. It was mm -hmm. another ladder to climb. Um, and we had been strengthening that, that foundation and that sense of trust to make these types of things easier for us. So I think the lesson in all that is 
it didn't all come at once. It came in waves, and, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And it makes it easier to deal with. It. Mm-hmm. But if it doesn't come in waves, um, it'll be a larger mountain than it needed to be. So I thank you for allowing me to explore, um, allowing me to find out who I was and figure out what my dreams are. And I'm still figuring that out. Mm-hmm. I'm still young, um, as old as 24, as 25 sounds. It's not too old, but still. Um, there, there's so much still to learn and, and so much life left to live that I can't I can't really see myself getting to this point without that level of support. So I want to thank you for that and you know ask you to continue with that uh, as I pursue these these dreams of mine that I still can't necessarily verbalize, but I'm figuring out on my own. So thank you. Wow. Uh, Sweet. I am, again, I'm so proud of you. And, you know, if this conversation really just forces me to go back. And quite frankly, I think that the, you know, getting you and me comfortable with leaving, you know, being away from home really started before that. Because I remember you going away to stay with your grandparents for 30 days, for the month of June. Every year was the month of June, right? You would go and stay in Dayton with your grandparents for those 30 days. And at first I was like, no. (laughs) Um, But it got easier and easier each time you went because the one thing that I always felt as a part of our process is that I wanted you to be comfortable if anything were to happen to me that one, I know you to be devastated, right? But you would be emotionally capable to move on. And so the common theme has been for us really about our family because our family has enabled us. The village that we had has been critical in our process and in any transition. Your family, we talk about uh, you and I as a family unit, but we we have a very strong support system, and that village has been very key in helping stabilize some of those transitions. And when I say stabilize, I think being able to have another opinion or somebody else to talk to to say, hey, is this even a good idea for him, for me to allow him to go this far away from home? Um, you know, so you've got, had the, the time in Dayton for 30 days every summer up until you were about what, 13? Yeah, more or less. Something like that's that. That's when I started going to camp for 30 days. Then you the got, summer, yeah, so. then you had camp, Camp Ernst and camp after camp after camp and the trips you took in school, um, to Washington, DC, to Camp Kern. I mean, you name it, right? And then your trip with Uncle Morris and Aunt Allison to the Bahamas, right? So these are things, Guatemala, like these are things that you've done uh, without me. So believe me, by the time you were ready to, you know, make bigger steps, I was somewhat prepared for that. And so I think that has been important, but that basis of having a great family, um, that trust between us, and, and what you're trusting as a parent, you're trusting that you've given, I've given you the tools and the, you know, the skills and that you're not going to go out here and make a total mockery of our family name, right? <laughs> when you go out. So I, I really believe that um, that trust, that family um, grounding, the village, all of that combined made for the stability that we had in those transitions. So that was really great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, over the years, we people have always asked me, how do you do it as a single mom? And I don't ever think that we put a lot of, or I put a lot of emphasis on being a single mom. I knew that that was our reality, but because we had such a strong village and that, you know, there was a priority there, right? The priority for me being you 
your success and most importantly your education and just exposing you to things is there anything that you know as you think about being in you know a family unit that was just the two of us that you you know could do differently that we would do differently um I don't know I think that from my perspective um, I was always given opportunities um, that people with more traditional family units either had or didn't have Um, so I never felt like I didn't get an opportunity or I was held back because um, of our situation Um, I think if anything as I grew up it was more so the lessons that I might not have learned um, from in a more traditional household that rang more true to me um, versus the actual opportunities that I got to experience. Um, I, I say it all the time. I think I had a great childhood um, from the things I was able to do from an extracurricular perspective, the plays, the sports, the clubs. I mean, I, I was in Latin club for, for years, for example, um, to the trips, to everything, right? Um, I, that never faltered because of our situation and we can attribute that to like you said the village right um, from the weavers picking us up from school mm-hmm. um, to going over mr. Thomas's house after school some days the extended day um, for grandma taking me to school in the mornings all these different things kind of allowed us to live the lifestyle that we did so for me in that perspective I didn't feel like I was lacking I mean I had a car when I was 17 I even had a, a parking spot right <laughs> right in the middle of my campus. So, you know, I, I had it all. Um, and I, I felt on top of the world at those ages. And I felt like I could do anything. And I think that's the foundation that any kid would want and, and needs, really, um, to get that confidence to defeat the imposter syndrome that you sometimes face in, in certain rooms and in certain circles as you get there and, and continue to climb the ladder in life. So... From a foundational perspective, there was nothing um, that I felt should be different um, in hindsight or during that time. Now, as far as from your perspective, I know that there was a lot of difficulties um, that I wasn't privy to, right? So um, I just always wanted you to know um, and really everyone to know, right, that my life couldn't have been better um, even if I had two parents in it from start to finish. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, and a lot of that was just running with opportunities that I had. There was nothing that I could have asked for more. Every Christmas was great. Every birthday was great. My summer vacations were as good as anyone else's and my winter vacations were as good as anyone else's. We had a family that brought other people in and around. Um, I had social networks that brought me in and around their families. So there was nothing that lacked. Uh, there was nothing that I could have asked for more as a kid. And these are experiences that, you know, I want to give to my kids someday as well. Um, so I look at you as a parent, um, as my number one role model for being a parent, because I've seen other people's situations from the outside, and I want a situation more like ours than anyone else's. So, yeah, no, I, to, if that answers your question, I don't, I don't know if I did or not, but... Well, you're going to make me cry, but I, um, I'm going to hold back to tears. I, I appreciate you saying that. And uh, I think it's important for people to know as well that from his vantage point, as is awesome, it sounds awesome. I want to be, I need his parents. <laughs> I, need, I need his situation, right? When I grow up, however, from my standpoint, it wasn't as easy as it looked or sounds, right? Because it, that involved a lot of sacrifice. It involved a lot of prioritizing and making sure, you know, there were things happening in the background. And I think the, the fundamental piece of that was I never wanted you to feel like you had to be the man of this house. I always wanted you to feel like, you know, you were the kid that you were. And I, and I believe a lot of moms, especially we look to, uh, when we're single moms, look to the man child or the boys in our, that, you know, we've given birth to, to step up into 
a role that they're really not ready for. And so making sure that you didn't feel a lot of the bumps in the road along the way were very important to me and making sure you had that stability. I mean, we moved several times throughout your elementary school years and some of them were natural transitions. You know, I bought a house, but we also lost a house during that time. And I don't think you ever knew that, at least when you were very young, um, that I we lost a house to foreclosure. But I wanted that transition to be very seamless for you and making sure that, you know, we went to another home that was comfortable, that was actually, I think it was probably better than the <laughs> one we left. <laughs> it was an upgrade from where we left, but you stayed in the same school. You had the same friends. I mean, all of those things were unbeknownst to you, at least from my vantage point. I didn't think you knew that that was happening. And, you know, there were other major things happening behind the scenes. At least it was behind the scenes for you. But I felt that that was important. And a lot of times uh, as single parents, we live our lives out loud in front of our kids and they take on responsibilities that they shouldn't have to take on, even if it's just emotional. So I continue when I have the opportunity to speak to other single parents, whether it's single moms, single dads, that, you know, I encourage them to, to shield their kids from grown up issues, right? So good. That is, um, that is awesome. I just, again, I am really excited to hear you talk about your life, you know, growing up the last six years, you've had so many transitions and you've handled them with such poise and grace. And you've had some challenging moments. Uh, being in Denver, um, the pandemic was huge, right? Because right in the middle, middle of the pandemic, you were graduating from college and didn't the university didn't celebrate you all the way um, we traditionally would have, right? And and then at that point, I think you were like, I don't want any acknowledgement of this. I don't want pictures. I don't want. I don't want a cap and gown. I, I mean, you were like, look, I just don't want this. I want to almost forget this happened. Um, how do you feel about that now that you've moved beyond May of twenty twenty? Honestly, um, I think I view that as one of my biggest regrets, um, not celebrating myself in that moment. Um, so in college, one of the things I would do as a side hustle is I'd take graduation pictures, and I did this all four years. Um, mm -hmm. Even through the pandemic, um, I was taking people's graduation pictures, um, you know, medical school graduations, graduate school, undergrad graduations, even my peers' graduation pictures. and. I never wanted to have my own taken um, for that reason. I almost wanted to forget that it was happening. It didn't feel real. At the time, I had just come back from living abroad um, and interning in Denver. It had been six to eight months since I'd seen many of my closest friends on campus, and all of that had been you know, cut short. It was supposed to be kind of my sending off semester, let alone you know, just graduation, and for that to be taken away, um, it was a painful thing. Um, and then on top of that, I found out that I'd be starting my job six months after what was planned as well. Um, so there was a lot of things going on and beyond just the, the natural transition of college to either a work life or whatever your post-collegiate plans are, um, having this variable of COVID, that was something that everyone was dealing with, um, just kind of made it that much more complex. And I think that's what made it hard. Um, my way of compartmentalizing was telling myself that people are, you know, th this is a disease that people are dying from, you know, my my problems kind of fall fall lower on that, that spectrum when it comes to the fallout of COVID. And, and not to mention, this is something that affected every area of life. Um, and there's still things that, that haven't fully recovered from that. So I do kind of look back on that time and I can acknowledge how I felt, um, but I do wish that I would have, you know, taken those graduation pictures and 
kind of really celebrated myself in that moment because it was an accomplishment. Um, I know, and you know, this is kind of emotional, but one of the things I really wanted and looked forward to was for my great grandmother to be able to come and, you know, see me walk across that stage. Um, and you know, this is somebody that we ended up losing during COVID as well. So not being able to share that moment with her. And, you know, that was something that since I was a little kid, um, she expressed that she wanted to see me do, um, that was a painful experience, but at the same time, you know, we persevered and I think moving to Denver when I did, because, you know, the pandemic wasn't over when this happened, right. um, was kind of my escape from a lot of those issues and problems and my way to start over, um, because I didn't want to harbor on the fact that I'd lost out on so much of this stuff and, and be in a place where I was with a bunch of people going through the exact same thing. I just wanted to leave. Um, and I wanted to handle that time in my life the way that I could and wanted to, you know, busy myself with a new job and focusing on finding myself a new way in a, in a strange land. So it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy transition at all. Um, it's something that I'm still transitioning through. It's only been two years, two mm -hmm. and a half years since all of this happened. And, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what it means to be Swede as an adult. What does it mean to be, you know, the next iteration? I'm the third. Um, and, and how will I leave my stamp before I leave this earth? And these are all things that as I continue to figure out what that means, um, new challenges arise and, and new problems are presented with me to me that need to be solved and that's kind of the stage I'm in now but to say it, would be, it was easy would be an oversimplification mm -hmm. or even to say it's hard um, because it, it was both of those things there were some things that were easy like accepting my job you know this was one of the the highs mm -hmm. that I had carrying me through the situation and even with the company I'm with now them you know taking care of me through Yep. the pandemic um, from a financial perspective as well as an emotional perspective or but then it was hard to leave my family and um, to say goodbye to friends that you know I s still haven't seen some to this day so you know the, it was a lot of things going on but um, life moves on and as long as we have goals that we will work towards things will fall in place so it's not as much of a sore spot as it was but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't still going through that transition now. Does it help you to know that your mama is still trying to find herself too? <laughs> 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 so, I mean, you know, making a complete career change is every, every day, every week, every month is different. And so, you know, I don't think that process is over until we check out of here. So we're constantly evolving, we're constantly making transitions, and we're constantly working our way through what that means for us. So you're not in this boat alone, and know that all you gotta do is pick up the phone, and sometimes that's easier said than done, but uh, we're, we've all gone through it. I've been 25 before, or 24. I'm not going to give you 25 <laughs> until next month at four o'clock to be exact on January 22nd <laughs> when you made it into this world. But it is, uh, it's, it's a, it's an ever changing, ever evolving process. And that's what makes life fun. It's how you approach it. It's how you deal with problems. It's how you learn and grow. And fundamentally, I believe that we grow the most when we're the most uncomfortable okay so just to, that wasn't supposed to turn into a counseling session but i'll give you that one for free okay <laughs> you wouldn't be my mom if you did <laughs> right okay um now there is one person that is not on camera with us but has been a very intricate part of our um transitions of our lives and that's makeda right so makeda Many people who know us know that Makeda is um, my daughter, and I did not give birth to her, but she is a family member. She is, um, she lived with us for three years. She transitioned into our home uh, over a period of time, but then it became permanent when she was, what, 14, 14, 15? Something like that, yeah. 
and then she transitioned out. So we can't we can't talk about our family without talking about Makeda, right? Yeah. And so at some point we'll do a conversation with her as well. But let's talk about your transition to having a sister. Um, honestly, I was excited. I think contrary to popular belief, um, it gets lonely being an only child. Um, and even though I had all of these extended family members that I grew up pretty closely around, um, I'd still have to go home by myself at the end of the day. And I think having Makeda in the house gave me someone not only to look up to, but um, another friend. Um, Makeda, you know, was the catalyst behind the music I listen to, the clothes that I wear, um, my ability to download things on the internet. <laughs> uh, I mean, everything, um, anything that you can think of that a kid would shape a kid's personality. I think Makeda had an effect and influence on mine. So trans her transition into the house, I think, was easy for me. Um, it was something that I wanted. Um, it's something that we had talked about for years, really, until it happened. So I had been looking forward to it, but as soon as when it happened, I mean, it, it was it was real. And not only did she move into our home at a time when I wasn't here, um, it was one of those summers that I spent away. Um, but we actually moved into the home that we live in now during this period as well. So not only were we adding someone into our immediate family, but we were moving our immediate family to somewhere completely different. So all of these things kind of happening at the same time um, was a huge level of excitement for me. Um, and I mean, to this day, this is one of my best friends. This is someone who I, I think I can be open and honest about with anything. Um, and like I said, this is the foundational influence for the, a lot of the things that I like and enjoy to this day. Um, I wouldn't be sweet without Makeda. So, um, you know, this is my big sister, my big cousin. However you want to spin it, um, she had an incomparable influence on my life as a, as a young man and my ability to kind of see the world and the people of the world for who they are. I think one of the, the biggest things Makeda taught me from a young age is that people are people. Um, no matter who you are, what their background is, how much money they have, people are people. And that's a lesson that I've been able to carry um, socially and professionally as, you know, as I travel the world, as I travel the country, as I sit in meetings with certain executives and, you know, face all these people who from the outside are, you know, a quote unquote level above. Mm -hmm. I think I always look at Makeda and not only her life, but her interactions and and realize that people are people and, and that's made it easy to talk to and connect with just about anyone. Mm -hmm. So for that, I, I think I'll forever um, be at her, her mercy and, and I'm just thankful um, for her being introduced in my life. I, I, I can't say it enough. I can't, I really can't. Um, like I love, I love Makeda and I'm looking forward to the day we can have this conversation as a trio because like you said, um, she's a part of our family. Um, just as much as either one of us are mm -hmm. at this point. So um, it'll be an interesting day when that happens. And I know it's hard to get us all three in a room. I mean, we all live in, <laughs> I mean, yes. what, 1,200 miles for her, 1,200 miles for me, and 1,200 miles between us, if not more. So it's a um, long ways between us. But I think that triangle and that triad will always, always be the foundational place in our heart. Yep. Oh, you're going to make me cry again. Yes, Makeda is, um, she has taught me as much about life and um, watching her grow and fly and go through her own um, changes has helped me in so many ways uh, as, as much as I have helped her. And, and she has no problem reminding me, like, I'm this way because of you, Aunt Felicia. I'm this way because of you. <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm going to get the credit and the blame when it comes to Makeda. So, um, yes, she is definitely has been a, a, an asset to, to me individually, to you, and to us as a unit. So I look forward to that time as well. So, with that, uh, this has been a dynamic discussion. I appreciate you so much for taking the time. You are very focused and very strategic and very um, intentional with your time. And so for us to just be able to just kind of sit and chill and conversate is important to me. 
I always enjoy our time together. Uh, sometimes I wish it was a lot more, but I recognize that you are my man child. You are no longer my <laughs> child. And so you have a life of your own. And as much as I want to be selfish, more than that, I want to see you enjoy life, to fly, to have an impact on this world as you do so well. And um, just continue to do what you do. And, you know, you got it from your mama. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for joining us, taking the time to listen to us share some of our, our challenges, our process, and, you know, all about transitions. And we will be back with more to share in the coming days, weeks, and months. Happy Holy Days. And I wish you peace and prosperity moving into the new year. Thank you. Happy New Year. <laughs>